Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. The, uh, my thought tonight is uh, the topic will be beginnings. Uh, the topic I thought from, I chose from my thoughts this week is connected to how many times um, we relate uh, to beginnings versus endings. Whether we want to or not, we are all in one way or another involved and affected by this pandemic. Hopefully, we will soon be on the other side of this moment in time, and we will then be able to look back with some clarity. Again, hindsight is twenty twenty. So what are we going to see when we look back? We will see some things that we should have done, others that we should have done better, and still others that were errors in judgment. Hopefully, with all that information, we'll be able to assess properly all the positives and all the negatives, and, and grow from our experience. Like all difficult and trying periods in our lives, when we look back on these days, well, we'll tell others about all of our trials and tribulations, how we succeeded and how we failed. But most of all, we'll convey to others a, a certain sense of accomplishment. We survived. And today we are in some way better than we were before this pandemic occurred. The truth is that there is no challenge in life, none no matter how insignificant it may seem in the moment, that after everything is said and done, will not make you better, stronger, or smarter in some way. When you recall your life experiences to someone, uh, what you talk about are the difficult times, those moments when you, that you were, when you were able to overcome challenges and all that you gained and learned from that experience. Reliving those challenges after the fact brings you a sense of satisfaction. You know, I always tell people, why enjoy your challenges in life only in hindsight? No. While you're in the midst of your experience, that this will be a moment that you will relive again and again. Enjoy it in the present, not just in the future. We must know and believe that failure is the stepping stone to success. You know, many times the more difficult the beginning, the more beneficial the end. Let us examine some scenarios found in, found in the Torah and see what we learn from them. Yaakov, our father, was forced to run for his life after he took his brother Esau's blessing. He then had to spend 20 years living with his evil and devious father-in-law, Lavan. If not for God's personal intervention, well, Lavan may well have killed Yaakov and his family when they left Haran. And then to make matters worse, <laughs> After he was saved from his father-in-law's nefarious plot, he was informed that his brother Esau was coming to meet him with an army of 400 armed men. But we know his greatest moment of trepidation becomes his greatest moment of salvation. Somehow, when the two brothers meet, they hug and kiss instead of battling with each other. A disaster was averted and peace prevailed. The beginning may have been dubious, but the end was positive. But then in the city of Shechem, Yaakov's daughter Dina is raped by the prince of the city. Rachel, his favorite wife, dies on the road and he buries her there on the road outside of Bethlehem. He mourns the loss of his beloved son Yosef for 22 years. There is a famine in the land and he is forced to send 10 of his sons to Egypt to buy food. They come back with a report that they had been accused by the viceroy of being spies. They told their father that their brother Shimon had been taken prisoner. They also told him that the viceroy was insisting that they return with Binyamin, their youngest brother, before they could purchase any more food. Without Binyamin going down to Egypt, well, Shimon would remain incarcerated and the family would not be able to buy any food to live on. Yaakov saw the scenario as just another dagger thrust into his heart. But let's look at the ending. Yaakov does go down to Egypt, thinking that this would be the final act of the tragedy that was his life. Instead, what do we read? Yaakov is accorded great honor and respect from Paro and the Egyptians. He spends the last 17 years of his life, 17, the gematria of the Hebrew word for tov, good, in joy and serenity, surrounded by his many children and grandchildren, together with his beloved son Yosef, the second most powerful man in the world. All's well that ends well. 
You know, Yosef's early years were a, a mixture of joy and sorrow. He had lost his mother when he was only eight and a half years old. His father adored him. And as a sign of his adoration, his father gave Yosef a coat of many colors, Kasonis Pasu. The coat only managed to increase the hatred that his brothers felt towards him. Then Yosef related his dreams to them, huh, dreams in which he dreamt about ruling over them. His dreams once again only intensified their animosity towards him to the point that, even they, that they even co contemplated killing him. But instead, they opted to sell him as a slave to Egypt. So, at the age of 17, he was uh, living as a slave in Egypt, thinking things couldn't get much worse. He was then accused of rape and thrown into a dungeon. It seemed as if all was lost and then his, that his life was really had hit rock bottom. While in prison, he interpreted the dreams of the chief butler and baker. His interpretations came true. The baker was hung and the butler was reinstated to his former position, just as Yosef had predicted. Yosef now thought his troubles would be over and the butler would be instrumental in securing his release from a state of incarceration. But no, it was only after two more years that the butler would finally mention Yosef to Paro. Then in an instant, on that very same day, Yosef is brought up from the dungeon where he interprets Paro's dreams, realizing Yosef's wisdom. Paro appoints him the viceroy of Egypt, the second most powerful man in the world. In the beginning of Yosef's journey was, to say the least, difficult on, on so many levels. But the Torah testifies that he never lost sight of his connection to God Almighty. It was said that the name of Hashem was always on his lips. Yosef was able to live up to his name, Yosef, in he, which means in Hebrew, to add on. Yosef never stopped growing. Wherever he was then was not good enough for now. He earned his 80 years of honor and royalty because of all the challenges that he experienced in the beginning. Again, all is well, that ends well. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, was born at a time when all the Jewish babies were being thrown into the Nile River. He was born prematurely after only six months, and so his mother was able to hide him from the Egyptians for three months. But then she was forced to act, and so she put him in a cradle. She put him in a cradle that was and floated him in the Nile. Basia, Paro's daughter, saw his cradle floating while she was bathing in the Nile. She takes Moshe's cradle from the Nile and brings him up as her adopted son. While he was very young, he developed a speech impediment that impaired his ability to communicate. So from the start, Moshe's life was turned upside down. He is brought up as a prince in the palace of Paro only to be accused of killing an Egyptian overseer. His accusers are none other than the two of his Jewish brethren, one of which he had just saved from being beaten to death by the same overseer the day before. He was forced to run for his life and live as a fugitive. There's a medrash that says on his travels he spent 40 years as the king of Ethiopia. He wandered, separated from his family, his people, and his home. But through all of his difficulties, he continued to grow. While in Midian, he saved Yisro's daughters from the shepherds that were accosting them. He then married Yisro's daughter, Tzipporah. Now, while shepherding Yisro's sheep, he encounters God in a fiery bush on the mountain. After 80 years of being divorced from his people, God tells him the time had come for him to reunite with them. God told him, that he had been chosen to lead the Jewish nation out of slavery and to bring them to the land that God had promised to their ancestors. Moshe refused. He felt unworthy, but God then assured him that everything that he had experienced in his life up until that moment was a, a preparation for this one and final mission, redeeming the Jewish people from the servitude of Egypt and bringing them to the land which God had promised to their forefathers. Though Moshe could not have understood all the twists and turns that occurred during the first 80 years of his life, there was no way that he could have foreseen what his mission in life would be. However, in hindsight, 
everything that he experienced, his beginnings, were all a preparation for what he would need to be successful in his final challenge. Without his beginnings, he would not have been able to achieve his glorious end. The Torah that God Almighty had given us carries his name. It's called Torah's Moshe. The Torah of Moshe. All's well. That's ends well. Let us look at the life of Dovin King David. In Psalm 118, verse 22, in the hollow, David states, Evan Masu Habonim Ho Silarash Pina. The stone which the builders disdained has become the chief cornerstone. From the moment of his birth, David Amalek was ostracized. It seemed that his father Yishai was a, a great tzaddik. The Talmud states that he was one of only four individuals that never sinned. Yishai was a descendant of Boaz and Ruth the Moabites. Yishai's grandfather, Boaz, had married Ruth the Moabite. Even though there was a Torah prohibition against bringing a Moabite or an Ammonite into the congregation of Israel, Boaz's court ordained that the law forbidding a Moabite from converting to Judaism pertained only to male offspring, not female. Yishai's uncertainty about the validity of his grandfather's decision to marry Ruth, so he, he then separated from his Jewish wife and mother of his seven sons. He then took his Canaanite slave woman, freed her, and took her as his wife. We are correcting a technical difficulty for a quick second. <laughs> Internet. Let's uh, let's try switching internet. Okay. Settings. Well, we will continue. It seemed that David's mother wanted more children from Yishai, so she and Yishai, new Canaanite wife slave, made a, a pact between them. Unbeknown to Yishai, one night David's mother entered the marital bed without Yishai's knowledge. And so, much like with Yaakov and Leah, Yishai spent the night with his former wife. From that union, she became pregnant with David. Seeing their mother pregnant, the brothers went so far as to ask their father to have her executed for infidelity. He refused. He told them that he would bring her child up as his own but that he would be separated from the rest of the family. So David grew up with uh, this dark cloud hanging over his head. His father sent him out in the fields to shepherd the sheep. That was where he spent most of his time. In the fields with the sheep, he, like many of his, our ancestors, was able to connect with God and himself in a very special way. No one in the family accepted him as a legitimate son of Yishai. It really wasn't until Shmuel HaNavi, Samuel the prophet, following God's command, came to Yishai's house to anoint a king from, among his son, from amongst his sons, that the truth was actually finally revealed. Yishai came with a jar of oil, ready to anoint a newly chosen monarch. Yishai had all of his sons line up, and they were all impressive men, especially Eliab, the eldest. Shmuel was certain that God had chosen him to replace Shaul as the next king of Israel. However, when Shmuel went to pour the oil on his head, it wouldn't pour, not for him, nor for any of his six siblings. <coughs> Seeing that nothing was happening, Yishai told Shmuel that, that they should go eat. Shmuel refused. He said, God has sent me here to anoint a king from amongst your sons. You must have another son. Yishai replied, well, yes, there is one son in the field, a nar, which translates in Hebrew as a young boy. David was 27 at the time. David came from the field and Shmuel lifted the jar of oil over his head and it flowed. David was anointed as the next king of Israel. Somehow, even after he was anointed by Shmuel, he still was treated as an outcast. 
As you read in the book of Shmuel, he wasn't even enlisted in the Jewish army when they faced Goliath and the Philistines. He only went to the battlefront because his father had asked him to check on his brothers. And even after he kills Goliath and marries Michal, King Shaul's daughter, still his life is far from tranquil. His father-in-law, King Shaul, tries to kill him again and again. David is forced to run for his life and live the life of a fugitive. Even after he is finally accepted as the king of the Jewish nation, his troubles continue. The incident concerning his eldest son, Amon, and of Shalom's sister, Tamar, which resulted in, the, in the, both of their deaths. The incident with Bathsheba and the loss of his newborn son. The rebellion of his beloved son, Avshalom, and his tragic death. But as a verse that I quoted from Psalm 118, verse 22, from Hollow, the stone which the builders threw away became the cornerstone. David Melech, through the beginnings of his life, was forced to learn humility and perseverance. He was groomed by God for the mission he would follow. Through his dedication to God and the nation, he had earned the right and the honor to be the king of Israel for 40 years. His son Shlomo would build the first temple in the merit of his father David. And finally, he is the father of Mashiach Sukena, the Messiah. May he come quickly and in our time. While writing this out, I realized that the first holiday of the year, Pesach, Passover, and the last holiday of the year, Purim, both began with the Hebrew letter Pe. Well, the letter Pe has a strong sound versus the letter Fe, which is soft. I also realized that there are other unique features that they both share. There were only two times in Jewish history that the whole Jewish nation was under foreign rule. First in Egypt, under the rule of the Egyptians in the story of Passover, and then again during the story of Purim, under Persian rule. If one were to miss celebrating Passover in the month of Nisan, the first month of the Hebrew calendar, they would still have the opportunity to make it up the next month, in year, referred to as Pesach Sheni, the second Passover. Purim is celebrated in the 12th month of the Hebrew calendar, the month of Adar. Adar is the only month of the Jewish calendar that can be doubled. It is called Adar Sheni, the second Adar. I wonder if there was a lesson for us to learn from this connection. The pain in the Hebrew word Pesach may allude to oppressive state of slavery that the Jewish nation experienced through their difficult and oppressive beginning, referred to as a kur barzo, an iron crucible. When they were redeemed, it made their salvation even greater. All's well that ends well. And so too with the holiday of Purim, the last holiday of the Jewish year. The name Purim also begins with the Hebrew letter Pe, strong. Though the Jews were facing total annihilation, it seemed that all would be lost, but then in an instant, their trepidation turned into joy. In fact, so much so that our rabbis tell us Nichnas Adar Marba Besimcha, that when the month of Adar enters, joy is increased. Though their beginning may have seemed hopeless, that is exactly what made their salvation even greater. So the month of Adar is not only one month of joy, but many years we are blessed with the Adar Sheni, a double measure of joy. All's well that ends well. So the bottom line, as the saying goes, know that in the end, everything will be good. So if it's not good, then it's not the end. Let us all look forward to the ultimate good that ends with the coming of Shia Sukenu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you. I'm sorry for any technical difficulties we may have had. Let me thank you for attending and listening. Again, God should bless you with health, happiness, and safety. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.